We have been working in Rwanda for about eight years. We were brought there by a nonprofit organization, the Partners in Health, who were building hospitals in Rwanda and asked us to assist in their construction. And I ended up working in Rwanda with this organization for the last eight years or so. And that's carried on from one project to many. We've established an office. We have 15 people working in Rwanda. Since then, we've gotten work throughout the subcontinent. So we're working in now 10 African countries and many of our Rwandan team are then going to these other projects uh, on site and starting those projects much like we did in, in Rwanda. Well there's a significant dearth of architects, licensed architects and planners in Africa, something like 25,000 licensed architects in the whole continent, which is like a quarter of what's in Italy uh, today. So there's a huge, huge need and demand for an investment in training the next generation of African architects, but with the huge youth bulge that's happening on the continent with the unbelievable growth of the cities that we'll see in the next 20 years, the biggest building boom in the world. If we don't invest in training designers, architects, thinkers, creative leaders in the subcontinent especially, we're going to see major public health disasters, major pollution, you know, incredible urbanization that's super problematic. I would say it's one of the most important needs of our time, actually. I think what architecture at its most effective acts as a, as a symbol for something to aspire to change the whole system at large. So what I mean by that is one hospital is great for that community, but if we design it in such a way that we're trying to change the entire infrastructure of hospital construction, that's when architecture becomes a messenger for, or a metaphor for something greater than it itself. So our ambition is to use these buildings as mechanisms for systems change at a higher level as opposed to just buildings full stop that serve one community. The clients for the Alima Primary School are the African Wildlife Foundation. African Wildlife Foundation is a large conservation organization throughout Africa, they're working in many remote areas, uh, investing in conserving you know, some of the great resources of the continent. This part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the only place where the bonobo ape exists. And it's this amazing largely unprotected area which people are living agrarian lifestyle and often sometimes are having to rely on bush meat and sometimes killing the ape in order to survive incredible poverty very limited resources limited infrastructure and so the african wildlife foundation is one of the only nonprofits working in that area wanted to invest more than just conservation they wanted to invest in the communities that live there provide them resources so that they're not forced to have to make the difficult decisions between um, killing some of their biggest assets in order to survive, but actually giving other opportunities to survive, like education, like training, um, like agrarian opportunities, uh, like work, jobs. And so we went with uh, African Wildlife Foundation uh, to design and build a school for this community deep inside of Equator province of the DRC, which is about a three-day trip to get there. It's very far. The community was deeply involved. I mean, the whole thing was built with and for the community. And Andrew and, and our two designers from Kinshasa, Jonathan and Jiansi, who joined us, joined Andrew, the three of them were there hired people who could you know, cut trees down, were hiring local women to go gar garner rocks and for foundation, working with uh, these masons and other masons from around to find the best mud block that they could, they could develop and then we're training them, training each other in some sense of finding the best mud block. It was really fascinating that you know, these masons knew where to get the best soil, they knew how to make the blocks, that's how they make their houses and Andrew said, he saw one of them working with palm oil and another not. So he said, well, this guy's, are these blocks more sustainable? Are they more resilient uh, as a terrain than the, the blocks that 
weren't using palm oil mix. And so he was testing them and in some sense created an ideal. Together they created a better mix than the guy already working with the palm oil. So there was this continuum of testing, which I think the design approach objectively brought to that process and improved upon. And you know, our hope is that we see some of these techniques being replicated throughout the village on other buildings that, that get built. And it just opened, so we'll see the, the further impacts as they move along over the course of the next year or two. But we're very excited about it, and I think it's an example of how we try to leverage as much uh, local knowledge and practice as possible to develop an architecture which is both of that place but also um, full stop architecture that's a kind of international statement that we can build from what we have available around us.